Welcome to the Wednesday Night Bible Study here at Faith and Victory Church. So glad to have you joining us tonight, and I trust you're having a great week, and God's blessing you well, as he always does, and um, just ready for another uh, time in the Word. Praise the Lord. Uh, we're continuing our series, The Bible, In the Light of Our Redemption by E.W. Kenyon, and um, we are on lesson number eight. Lesson number eight, praise the Lord, and we're studying tonight the Abrahamic Covenant, the Abrahamic Covenant, praise God. Previous lessons, we've been we have studied about um, man dying spiritually, his need for a mediator, his need for righteousness, his need for eternal life, um, which all those things can only be met by the incarnation of the Son of God, and um, we... Um, Last time we traced the working of grace, of the grace of God, from the time He gave man the promise of incarnation to the flood, and um, the uh, the flood of Noah, and the preservation of a righteous line. Praise the Lord! Um, remember, there were two means by which Satan was trying to stop the righteous line, um, or the purpose of God, uh, which was the incarnation. He wanted to destroy the knowledge of God from the earth. And destroy the righteous line. Not lion, but line. L-I-N-E. The lineage. Make sure my southern didn't mess you up. Because somebody said, well, Jesus is the righteous line. Well, I, I meant line. L-I-N-E. Okay. Now, from the time of the flood to the, the building of the Tower of Babel, uh, the earth was um, worshiping God. Not um, not all men accepted that, but it was it, God's knowledge of God was still there. Um, the, many wicked, wicked rebelled against rebelled against it, um, but the, the knowledge and the revelation of the true God was still very fresh in the minds of humanity, and um, the, the setting up of many false gods wasn't as prevalent because you know there was still the fear of God, much like America, you know, for for so long. Um, the pluralism and the stuff we see today was would not was just wouldn't been accepted uh, even 50 years ago. Uh, even even by un, unborn again people, they would still say, you know, uh, I'm, this is a Christian nation. And um, and uh, Barack Obama proudly announced that we were no longer a Christian nation, but a pluralistic nation. And uh, during his presidency, and uh, I say proud that he was proud about it, but it was nothing proud proud to be about it. We've gone been going downhill. Um, dramatically since um, those kind of statements were made. Um, you know, the head of a nation that people vote for uh, can set courses for the spiritual atmosphere of a nation. So we have to be very careful about those things. Um, in the ninth chapter of Genesis, God had command, uh, given a, a, a recommand to replenish the earth. And then by the time we get to chapter 11, uh, we see that the whole earth was uh, one language, one speech. The unity of the race was one untouched. They all spoke the same language. The whole, the whole earth was really one mind. And they even got to the point that said, well, let's build a tower into heaven. They were going to build a tower into heaven. So God comes down and says, let us, we got to do something because nothing will, will be refrained from them. Um, and they began to multiply on the earth. The um, place where they had resided after, after Noah had um, Built the ark and it was and it was um, came to rest in Armenia. Um, could no longer su support it, human race. So they entered into the uh, Shinar Valley and plains uh, in Genesis eleven two, and they were uh, setting up a city there and going to build that tower to heaven. And when the Lord came down and confounded the language and scattered them, uh, they went to all. They started going to all the earth. Um, people went to you know to, to Europe and to the Middle East and to the Far East and to North Asia to South Asia uh, to the Far East and uh, they eventually began to uh, spread to the islands across land bridges uh, across the um, uh, into Alaska and down the Americas um, until the, until the, you know man was all over the, all over the planet. Um, as this took place, the worship uh, of the one true God began to diminish and became, uh, they became worshipers of, of nature, uh, worshipers of an ancestral worship, 
uh, worshipers of false gods in sense knowledge began to take the place of God's revelation knowledge um, because sense knowledge appeased um, and, and was was compatible with spiritually dead men who couldn't who, who didn't have spiritual intuition to know the true of the living God who is a spirit and they began they began to worship things that their flesh um, their five senses their mind their will their intellect their emotions could connect to not, not their mind, the will, intellect, emotion. I'm sorry. I just gave you the definition of the soul. Their, their, their smell, their taste, their touch, their sight, and their hearing um, is what they began to build gods after, things they could see, things they could hear, things they could touch. They may worship the thunder. They may worship um, idols. They may worship, um, you know, the ground or grass or, you know. Um, and when you look in, in the history of... Um, religious books of all of, of false religions they they all account of a revelation of a creating god uh even the flood um uh, is written there in these um in their writings and traditions we get a clear picture that there was at one point a true worship of one true god that descended into the worship of many gods and then many false idols um so after the flood, 367 years after the flood, Abraham appears. And, uh, and Abraham's life and Noah's life actually, time-wise, overlap for about 50 years. So Abraham was about 50 when Noah died. Now, there's no um, um, record that they actually knew each other. Um, very, very likely they didn't. Um, it, I mean, but they were still both alive during the same period of time. And um, Abraham or Abram had been born in the Ur of the Chaldees, and it was a it was a, um, a splendid ancient city, but also a um, heathenistic city. <laughs> Shocker! Um, and God had, God revealed Himself to Abraham. Because by then, the, the revelation of God was once again almost lost. And he had to find, um, if he's going to send his or, uh, incarnate son through this righteous lineage, he had to find someone who would worship him, serve him, and preserve that line and the knowledge of God himself upon the earth. Um, Abraham's family were idolaters. God, yet God was going to form a nation that would preserve the, the, his revelation to man and the knowledge of man's redeemer so he could be recognized when he came. So Dave, Abraham had to be removed from these influences. That's why he said, get thee out of that country, away from that kingdom, out of thy father's house, and go into a place that I will show thee. And he disobeyed when he took Lot. He, should, like he wasn't supposed to take Lot. And that caused, that, that caused problems. That caused problems later down the road. Uh, because remember we talked about when, when Sodom and Gomorrah uh, Lot vexed his righteous soul daily. And um, so Abraham had to be, had to be removed. And um, historically, there are legends that say that Abraham was persecuted for his uh, refusal to worship idols. Uh, so by the call of God, he searched, went out to a land um, where God was going to use him to found a, a free land, free of, idol of idolatry, and would worship him. Um, 25 years after Abraham received the call from God, um, the greatest event in human history until the birth of Christ took place, it was the blood covenant in which Jehovah and Abraham entered. Wow. God entered into a blood covenant with Abraham. Before we, now, before you can understand the significance of the covenant, the God cut with Abraham. You have to know the meaning of the blood covenant. Blood covenant. Um, now it existed, it existed before Abraham. Is actually we have the first blood covenant with Adam. Adam and God um, went all the way back there where he killed the animals and slew and shed their blood to cover the sin of Adam. Um, and so from the very beginning, the revelation of the blood covenant was there, and um, each time God, God made promises. And um, a common revelation of the blood covenant was um, 
even passed on to primitive man. We go back and study um, um, uh, H. Clay Trumbull's book, The Blood Covenant, which uh, tracks the um, African uh, missionary journeys of uh, Stanley and Livingston <clears throat> and how that they um, you know, went in and cut covenant uh, uh, actually, Stanley uh, did much much of the covenant cutting uh, th throughout the continent of Africa uh, in order to, to do his travels and so forth and journeys, and uh, they they learned a lot about covenant. And uh, so that book that book is uh, what? How do you say intellectual reading? It's not light bedside reading. Um, it's it's written in a very um, I would say academic uh, type setting um, probably a, a book you would put in a theological seminary to study blood covenant rights um, it, it's written on that kind of level however we learn all, you get a lot of information out of it and uh, they're very good information um, you know after the, the scattering of man at the Tower of Babel Noah um, possessed obviously a knowledge of blood covenant that he uh, handed his children and, and how did he handle his children so that um, nations were formed from the dispersion of the Tower of Babel? Each one possessed a knowledge of the blood covenant. Um, now, here's some things from H. Uh, Clay Trumbull's book, um, The Blood Covenant. From the very beginning and everywhere, blood seems to have looked upon uh, as preeminently the representative of life, as indeed. In a peculiar sense, life itself. The transference of blood from one organism to another has been counted the transference of life with all that life includes. The inner commingling of blood by its intertransference has been understood as equivalent to the intercommingling of natures. Two natures thus intercommingled by the intercommingling of blood have been considered as forming thenceforth one blood, one life, one nature, one soul, and two organisms. Like I said, this is not bedside reading. <laughs> Hallelujah. The in intercommingling of natures by the intercommingling of blood. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And a higher organism, even between man and deity, actually, or by symbol, as well as between man and his intimate, uh, immediate fellow, <clears throat> A, a covenant of blood, a covenant made by the intercommingling of blood, has been recognized as the closest, the holiest, and the most indissoluble compact conceivable. Now, that is a mouthful. Um, let's just say that uh, Trumbull was, was saying that by cutting the covenant and sharing blood, and we can get into all the different ways that that was done, um, they, they became blood relatives and that uh, with deity with a substitute between God and deity um, it became a, a close holy and indissoluble compact now three reasons men would cut covenant with each other now this some of this is still coming from you know some of these these thoughts are still coming from the book the blood covenant by H. Clay Trumbull <clears throat> If a strong tribe lives by the side of a weaker tribe and there's a danger of the weaker tribe being destroyed, the weaker will seek to cut the covenant with the stronger tribe that they may be preserved. Now, if the two parties would go into business together and one is going to leave the country and travel as far as a representative of covenant would be cut between the two. And if men each loved each other devotedly, like David and Jonathan, they would cut a covenant. The moment the blood covenant is solemnized, everything that a blood covenant man owns is at the disposal of his blood brother. Yet, the blood brother would never ask anything unless he absolutely driven by want to do it. In other words, David, it was to the point that my wife is your wife and your wife is my wife, but because they were blood covenant brothers, they would never ask that way. Does that make sense? But they were absolutely one in their in, in their um, relationship. Another feature is as soon as the covenant was cut, they were called by others blood brothers. 
That blood covenant goes down through generations. It is an indissoluble covenant that generations cannot erase. If a man cuts a covenant with his friend, the children of the two families are bound to observe it. Um, Stanley uh, shared this, Dr. St uh, uh, Mr. Stanley, and, and Dr. Livingston uh, bore witness to that if two men in Africa cut the covenant and one tried to break it, the nearest relatives of the breaker would seek his death. For no, You couldn't live in Africa and break a covenant. Uh, you cursed everything around you. There's nothing absolutely sacred with us, but in Africa the covenant is sacred. Mr. Stanley and Dr. Livingston both testify they never knew the covenant to be broken. Wow. Um, the method of cutting the covenant is practically the same the world over. Some places it's de uh, degenerated into a very grotesque rite, but it is the same blood covenant. It's still the basis of the same um, ideology and thought that where they were cutting covenant. The, the, the method that is practiced by the Africans, Arabians, Syrians, and Balkans kind of come this way. Uh, two men who wish to cut the covenant come together with friends and a priest. They exchange gifts. They bring a cup of wine. The pre priest makes an incision in the arm of each man, allowing blood to drip into the wine. They mingle the wine. Uh, then they mingle the wine and drink it. Now they're blood brothers. Now, other ways were done where they would cut. Uh, cut the wrist, put the wrist together, and actually would put like gunpowder into the the wound, so that it would ne it would heal with that mark, that would never go away. As a symbol, they were in blood covenant uh, with someone. The Abrahamic covenant. The seventeenth chapter of Genesis takes uh, can take on a new meaning for us. Um, when God made a covenant with him. Abraham knew what it meant. God was coming into a covenant of strong friendship, which is what the blood covenant had, would refer to, the covenant of strong friendship, which is why Abraham was called the friend of God. In James 2, 23, Isaiah 41, 8, and 2 Chronicles 20 and 7. Um, Abraham is the only human being who is called the friend of God in the Old Testament. The, God, uh, the covenant God cut with Abraham was to bring is the Israelite nation into being as a covenant people. Isn't that wonderful? Um, he was going to take up Abraham and create a nation. And out of that nation would be the lineage of Jesus, praise God. Genesis 17, 7, I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee and their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Then God gave to Abraham the method of cutting the covenant. And that was the uh, removal of the foreskin, and what we call circumcision. The seal of the covenant was circumcision. Every male, ch every male child was circumcised at the day of eight days. And that circumcision was the entrance into the covenant. Now remember the New Testament, the Bible says, that the, the, uh, we're, we come into the covenant with God, not with the circumcision of the flesh, but of the heart. We have a heart circumcision. The cutting away of that, uh, of our heart, away around our heart, making a way for God to write his laws into our hearts and our minds. Hallelujah. Glory to God. In Genesis 17, 26, in the self-same day, Abraham was circumcised and after where he bore in his flesh the evidence that he had entered into a blood covenant of friendship with God. To this day, Abraham is designated in the East as the friend of God. After the formal covenant of blood has been between, cut between God and Abraham, there came a testing of Abraham's fidelity to that covenant. The testing would also give evidence to the future generations that cutting of the covenant on the part of Abraham and the rite of circumcision had not been an empty ceremony, but that he had pledged his very life to Jehovah. Look in Genesis 15. And he 
said, and he believed in him and counted it to him for righteousness. Abraham believed God. It was counted to him for righteousness. Um, the word Heman, H-E-E-M, E-E-M, has been translated, believed in, carries the idea of unqualified committal of oneself to another. Abraham so trusted Jehovah that he was ready to commit himself to Jehovah as in the blood right of the blood covenant. Therefore, God counted Abraham's spirit of loving and longing trust as ready for a blood covenant friendship between them. The test came when Isaac, a blood covenant child that God had miraculously given to Abraham, um, was 18 to 20 years old. This is when the true test comes. And it came to pass after these things that God did prove Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, he said, here am I. He said, take now thy son, thine only son, whom thou lovest, even Isaac, and get thee into the land of Moriah and offer him there for a burnt offering unto me upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. Now he's in a blood covenant. There's nothing he withholds from God. Genesis 22, 1, through 1 and 2. God asked for him to do, offer his son up as a sacrifice to him. Abraham doesn't question it. He immediately obeys. And the response of his divine friend. It is well to recognize the Asian thought in a translation like this. An Asian father prizes an only son more than he prizes his own life. An Asian father to die without a son is a terrible thought. But with a son to take his place, he's ready to die. So for Abraham to do this was a major, major, major step um, in obedience and commitment to the covenant. All the world over, men in the covenant of blood friendship were ready to give that which was dearer than life itself to their blood covenant brothers or gods. Would Abraham do as much for his divine friend as men would do for their human friends? Would Abraham surrender to God all that the worshipers of other gods were willing to surrender in proof of their devotedness? These were questions to be answered before the world. Go ahead and add Genesis 22. Abraham showed himself capable of such friendship as in this blood covenant with Jehovah. Reading in chapter 22, verse 3. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son and claved the wood and, the, and claved the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went to the place which God had told him. And then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said unto the young men, Abide ye here with the ass. And uh, here's your, here is faith. I said, here is faith. And I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again unto you. I am the lad will go yonder and worship and come again unto you. He didn't say, I'm going to go worship. Where are they going to go worship? And I'll come back. He said, I am the lad will go worship and come again to you. Hallelujah. Are you, are you out there? Hallelujah. <clears throat> and praise God. <clears throat> Glory to God. Amen. Um, Look, Hebrews 11, to hold your place there. Hebrews 11, 19. Accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead. For whence also he received him in a figure. <coughs> now, Abraham knew his blood covenant partner had already told him that in Isaac his seed shall be. Yet God says offer him as a sacrifice. And Hebrews gives us the insight into the, uh, Abraham's thinking. He had already received and raised from the dead because his blood covenant partner had made a promise and made a declaration. And even with the request of offering him as a sacrifice, he would have to raise him up from the dead, from those ashes and give him back to Abraham. 
Glory to God. Um, and he took the wood, the burnt offering, laid it upon Isaac, his son, and he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they went both of them together. And Isaac spake unto Abraham, his father, he said, My father, he said, Here am I, my son. He said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? <laughs> And uh, Abraham said, my son, God will provide himself a lamb and for a burnt offering. So they both went together. <clears throat> and it came to the place which Abraham, had, God had told him of. And Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar. Now, you got you to think now, Isaac's got to be in faith with him. <coughs> I've got to think that at some point he figures out he's the offering. If he's not in faith, he's not, he's not just going to stand there and go, go ahead. He's going to be like, wait, oh, wait, what? I mean, man, you're crazy. Unless he's in faith also. He laid him on the altar with the wood. He stretched forth his hand, took the knife and to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called out of heaven, said, Abraham, Abraham. He said, here am I. He said, lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do him any, anything to him. For now I know thou fearest God. See, thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked. And behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah-Jireh. That is, the Lord will provide. <clears throat> as it said this day in the mount of the Lord, it shall be seen. And the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of heaven. The second time he said, by myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, because thou hast done this thing and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, that in blessing, I will bless thee and in multiplying, I will multiply thee. Thy seed is the stars of the heaven and the sands of the, uh, of the um, and, and is the sand, which is upon the seashore. And thy seed shall possess the gate of, the, of his enemies. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. And Abraham returned unto the young men, and they rose up and went together to Beersheba. And Abraham dwelt at Beersheba. And it came to pass after all these things that it was told Abraham, saying, Behold, Michael, she hath born also a child unto his brother Nahor. Uh, Huz, his firstborn, and Buzz, his brother. And that sounds like some Eastern Carolina folk down there. Hallelujah. And Kamel, the father of Aram, and Ches uh, Cheset, and Hezo, and Pesat, Pedas, and Je yeah, and um, we're going to start speaking in tongues here. <coughs> so, Abraham obeys God. He did what he did in the spirit of devotedness to the covenant of God, yet the hand was stayed. The angel of Jehovah called a second time and said, By myself, by sworn, by my life. The foundation of the covenant, Godward. There was nothing that God could swear by except Himself. Now, to the Asian mind, remember the Bible is an Asian Eastern; it's an Eastern book. Uh, it meant I swear by myself. Now, if this fails, I become your slave. You own me. I put myself in bondage to you. They are bound together. All that God is belongs to Abraham and all that Abraham is or ever will have belongs to God in this covenant relationship. This is why you can understand. He says so many times I am Jehovah, though I am the Lord <coughs> who keep the covenants. He is the covenant keeping God back behind Israel with this solemn covenant that God had sealed on his side by putting himself in utter absolute bondage to that covenant. Now stop. Point we, we kind of missed here and didn't really cover that when God asked Abraham for his son and Abraham did not refuse, he opened the door for God to give his son to redeem humanity. <coughs> God, Abraham would not withhold from God Therefore, God did not withhold from Abraham the promise, incarnation, redeemer, substitute, hallelujah, glory to God.
So let's get into these questions real quick. Um, why did God confuse the languages at the Tower of Babel? And, uh, and it was in order to scatter men throughout the earth, which had been God's original command to replenish in the, uh, the earth in, in the first place. And um, why was the call from God, which is recorded in Genesis 12, 1 and 2, given to Abraham? Because his countrymen, Abraham's, were idolatrous. His countrymen and father were idolatrous. Abraham had, to be, Abraham had to be removed from the influences if a nation that would preserve God's revelation to man and the knowledge of man's redeemer were to continue. Question three says, tell the significance of the blood covenant as it existed among primitive peoples. And among primitive people is considered the closest, the holiest, and the most indissoluble compact conceivable. Number four, what were three reasons for cutting the covenant? And um, we have, we kind of um, streamlined the answers here. Preservation, business security, and love. And we're talking about, we're not talking about, well, a marriage covenant, a marriage relationship is a covenant. It's a marriage covenant, but, you know, um, even, even love covenants like David and Jonathan, who were really close friends, and they cut a covenant together for their mutual uh, protection and friendship. Why was Abraham called the friend of God? Because he was a blood covenant partner of God. And what was the seal of the, of the Abrahamic covenant, which is circumcision? What does the word in Genesis 15, 6 translated as believe really mean? Heman carries the idea of an unqualified committal of oneself to another. Are we getting overridden on the internet? Okay. What was the test that was given to prove Abraham's fidelity to the covenant? And it was to offer Isaac as a sacrifice to God. <clears throat> What did his obedience to God's command reveal? His obedience revealed that he was willing to do as much for God as he would for his human friends and that he was willing to make the same sacrifice for his God that the pagans were to their pagan false gods. And that was human sacrifice. And what did the phrase, by myself have I sworn and the promise God gave mean? And to the Oriental or Asian mindset, uh, it meant I swear by myself. Now, if this fails, I become your slave. You own me. I put myself in bondage to you. Praise God. So now we've gone through man's need for a, a mediator, eternal life, righteousness, the incarnation, the incarnation uh, is, is sent into a lineage. And we now have a righteous line that had to be preserved by the flood. And now God has called Abraham out and God has made a blood covenant with Abraham. There is now a blood covenant with Abraham and out of that blood covenant comes a blood covenant people. The Jewish nation. From which comes Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. With the promise, you know, we, we know from Galatians, and I know I'm probably going to get ahead of myself. That's all right. Galatians 3 says, if you be Christ, and then you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Amen. And he said the seed, not at seeds as of many, but one, which is Christ. God said that in, in Abraham's seed with all nations be blessed. He would have a covenant nation, but out of that nation, all nations would become blessed. Glory to God. God had a righteous line and that lineage that would take place and be developed <coughs> came into a blood covenant relationship with God. Abraham passing the test 
of absolute commitment to the covenant. Therefore, God unconditionally committed on his side of the covenant and gave us Jesus. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. Isn't that wonderful news? God is good and God is God. Can you say amen? God is God. God don't ever change that. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's a good one. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Well, um, that we kind of finished this one early tonight, but that's okay. Um, Sunday, we'll be continuing our series. Actually, we're moving to faithfulness. <coughs> the fruit of our spirit, of the spirit, faithfulness is on Sunday. You'll want to be there for that. Uh, until we meet again, God bless you. We love you. Thank you for joining us tonight. I want you to remember these words uh, written by uh, the Apostle John in 1 John chapter 5, verse 4. That whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. We love you. God bless you. See you next time here. Faith and Victory Church, online and in person. Good night.